What's going to happen, in my, my opinion, is the halving is going to occur. The fair value is going to increase because that's yep. what happens when the halving occurs. The fair value goes up because the price needs to adjust to support the miners. In this cycle, the fair value probably doesn't go up as much as previous cycles because we have this pre-halving event of the ETF, which boosted the price closer to fair value so that most of the miners are, are doing okay right now. But the fair value is probably gonna go up to, call it 75-ish K, would be my estimate. In a normal cycle, then the leverage comes in and it pushes that to 2.3, 2.4 times. Well, there's not as much leverage now because they got rid of CZ at Binance, so that's not as much leverage. And they got rid of some of the old bad actors in terms of the leveraged lenders. So let's say we only go up two times fair value this time. So we go to 150-ish. Well, then what happens? When you're so far above fair value, that's when the short sellers are come in and some of the people will say, okay, that's good enough for me. I'll take a little profit. And then we start to go down. But as it starts to roll over in the next bear market, which I think happens you know, at the end of 25, Yes. Then I, what I would love to know why you think into 25 because I have 25 as well. If you want to see more videos and interviews like this from influential people in tech, finance, and sports, subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the bell to be alerted. And go a step further and join the YouTube and membership area for early releases of videos like this. I'm out of here. Ha! Mark, thanks for coming on, man. I had to go back and check. I had you on on January 20th. That was the first time I had you on. 2023. Nice. All right. Uh, I think on that day it was National Cheese Day, Cheese Lovers Day. I don't know if you like cheese. <laughs> Alec Baldwin was charged for involuntary manslaughter on that day. I know you probably remember that case. I do and remember that. Yeah. Bitcoin's price. Where do you think Bitcoin's price was on January twentieth? January twentieth, twenty twenty three. Um. See, see, let's see no, how Bitcoin good Mark Yusko's gut check is. Probably about 16,000. One oh. six. Oof. 22,000. 22. So it had, it 22. had already rebounded a bit since November. It already all rebounded. Right. Already rebounded. That's almost like three times the price where we are right now, right? That's yeah. amazing. Uh, that's amazing. I, I have to give it to you. You were very, though you were, I, I, I would see you on, on the margin and, you were calling, uh, oh, Bitcoin summers here, Bitcoin springs here. And you were off a couple of times, but you you steadfast. You were hanging in there and it finally came. <laughs> it finally came. Yeah. <laughs> it finally came. So uh congratulations for sticking to it, man. That is amazing. So I just wanted to get you back on. I, I don't like, you know, I like having people on not just as a uh, customary thing just to have you on just yeah. to have you on I like to have people on when there's really something to talk about Absolutely. and we're about 16 as you can see we're at the time of recording we're about 16 days away from the having um, but what I really want to talk to you about because this wasn't even I don't think even in the conversation when I last had you on it's the ETF yeah. we have not talked since the ETF what what's your take? I, I mean, I'm I've, I'm sure you have opined on this many many times on various podcasts. The one thing I want to say is that I'm seeing like what 7,300 coins being purchased a day on average, 900 yeah. being minted. The math ain't math, and you go. <laughs> I, I love it. The math the math ain't math, and I might have to no. I might have to tag that. Um, <laughs> well, I always do math is hard, right? That's that's mm -hmm. my big thing. That the average person is not very good at math, right? But you're, you're right. The math ain't math. And, and look, we, you know, we recorded in January. In June, that was the big event. BlackRock yes. announced, I think it was June 15th, that they were putting their, their hat in the ring. And, you know, that was like a light switch. From that point, yes. it was guaranteed mm -hmm. that there was going to be an approval. And yeah, there were some machinations with courts and right and you know our buddy GG Gary. and all that good yeah. stuff but mm -hmm. but at the end of the day it was clear to me now i actually believed incorrectly that mm. they were going to play some games and that only blackrock was going to get approved and yeah, all the here. others would be I, I was left with behind. you and and that made me kind of sad because not sad unhappy because 
we are investors in both Bitwise and Amun now 21 shares. So we really wanted them to succeed. So our you know value of our investment would go up. But I was skeptical that that uh, the powers that be would let any of the new age upstarts compete with the old guard. But thankfully, I think there was enough political pressure on on the SEC to say, no, 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 all of them have to get approved. And it's been great for the consumer. And what I mean by the consumer is all my brothers and sisters, the boomers, right? The boomers are never going to hold. I mean, the average boomers never going to hold their own keys. They're never going to get a little ledger and, and, you know, do it just, it's just, that's just not their not thing. And so the idea that now you can own some of this asset they've heard about, and maybe their friends are talking about, or maybe their kids, mostly it's their kids are talking about that. They can own a little bit now in their IRA, their 401k, their, you know, Schwab account, Fidelity account, not Vanguard. Not um, Vanguard. Uh oh. But uh, <laughs> well, but but that was a calculated. I believe that was a calculated move by Vanguard to say, look, someone needs to be the stodgy old grumpy get off my lawn firm that all the disgruntled boomers who say, oh, I don't, I don't want this this new. I'm going to go there, and so because here's the thing, the boomers own all the wealth. Right. right. 40 Mm -hmm. plus trillion with a T. And, you know, the Gen X's and the millennials. Great. Someday be well. And there are certainly wealthy, you know, millennials today. But but on average, the average millennial has far less assets than the average boomer. That's just, you know, age and experience uh, and time. And again, that's not a judgment. It's just just fact. And so it makes some sense that the people who control the big amounts of wealth are afraid of this this upstart technology. So now let, me, let me ask you yeah. this, though, Mark. So we all know CEOs have a boss and their boss is the board of directors, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I heard that the CEO of Vanguard will be stepping down. Do you think that was there was some internal uh, it's a great conflict question. there? I mean, it's it's correlation versus causation. Sure. So, sure. you know, there's no question it's correlated, meaning it's happening in real time. Now, the question is, is it causation? Because this is a guy who's been around, I think, 33 years or some exactly. crazy number. So mm-hmm. it was probably in the cards. Now, it's unfortunate for him that the time, even if it wasn't causative, Right. Even if it wasn't, hey, I'm going to take this stand and I'm going to be wrong and I'm going to take a lot of bashing in the press. Even if that wasn't the case, all of us are going to say it is the case. And Mm so I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think it was mostly it was already in the cards. He was already planning this. Okay. I I don't believe they thought there'd be as much pushback or blowback as there was. You know, I don't think they thought people would actually leave, you know, literally close down their Vanguard account and go to Fidelity or somebody else who was more progressive. But in the end, I don't know that it matters all that much. I mean, this is one guy um, and that firm has been very successful in the mutual fund age. But as we move into the digital age, will they be the dominant player? No. Who's going to be the dominant player? Is it going to be Bitwise? Is it going to be 21 shares? Is it going to be ARC? I don't know. But it's not. Here's the thing. All of that $39 trillion or $59 trillion, I mean, $20 trillion between friends, you know, people throw out different numbers all the time of what mm-hmm. us boomers own. And... Boomers are 60 years to 85. And, you know, whether we like it or not, we're all going to pass. And that wealth is going to our kids and our grandkids and our philanthropy. And 
that generation, they're not staying with UBS. They're not staying with Merrill Lynch and Vanguard. Even Fidelity, as progressive as Fidelity is and as great as Abby has been at adopting Bitcoin and the digital and there's, and there's Fidelity Digital, I don't know. I, I feel like it's going to be a new brand, a new firm, a new ethos. But it's possible mm -hmm. that, that one of the old guard could, could move quickly enough to, to capture that that movement to the digital age yeah yeah it's possible it's possible so you know another thing i, I saw that was pretty interesting i don't know how to take this and i want to get your your feedback on this is that uh, i don't know if you saw the report that came out from an analyst saying that the average dollar yeah. amount from the uh, ibit etf sh uh, shares is about thirteen thousand dollars which would indicate this is not institutional buying here. These are most likely retail, as you yeah. said, it, mom, you know, some of the boomers through their pension funds and 401ks or whatnot are buying this. How do you feel about that? Is that to you a glass half full or glass half empty take on that, seeing that the institutions aren't really in there like I, I, I'm, at least I thought they were? Yeah, well, look, I, I actually never felt that the ETF was for the big institutions, right? It doesn't mean that they wouldn't use it, but it's, the yeah. ETF it's for a retail, me- It's a retail product. Yeah, it, it's, it's for the individual investor. And, and really what it was for was not the Robinhood crowd and not mm -hmm. the, the meme coin traders and, and the day traders. It was for, again, it's, it's a boomer wrapper. It's for the mm -hmm. boomers whose money has been kind of abdicated to a financial advisor. And the financial advisor works at one of these big platforms, UBS, Merrill Lynch, et cetera. And that total dollars is about 30 odd trillion. It's a lot. And I kept saying that, look, once the ETF was approved, at a bare minimum, right away, 10 basis points was going in. So mm. that's, you know, about $30 billion. And we've had about half of that so far. It's pretty good in whatever it's been, 10, 12 weeks. And so that's pretty amazing. Now, mm -hmm. 10 basis points is not where it's going to stay because Fidelity already said 1% to 3% in their kind of fund of funds ETF that allocates to other ETFs. They said, you know, one to three. And I think all these other places are gonna say, yeah, 1%, that's a good number. That's a good diversifier. Well, 1% of 30 trillion is 300 billion. Mm -hmm. That's more money than has ever gone into Bitcoin since day one. Yep. Just let that sink in for a second. 300 billion is more fiat than has ever been converted into Bitcoin. And yes, Bitcoin's market cap today is 1.3 trillion, but 1.3 trillion didn't go in. It was a very small fraction of that, somewhere in the 200 something billion uh, dollars. And the rest is appreciation because every time money goes in, it's to your point, 7,300 Bitcoin demanded and only 900 produced. Well, where's the other Bitcoin come from? That's a Holders. shift on the... And yeah. the only way a holder sells is if the price moves. That's right. That's how markets work, right? Everybody's always... I love when people say, oh, there's more buyers than sellers. Same no, amount. It's the same amount. There's, there's always the same number of buyers and sellers. Now, the incremental dollar can come from buyers or sellers, but that increment, right. like if, if you're a short seller and you're trying to you know, sell something that's overpriced, then in order for you to, to buy it back, you want the price to fall, right? That, that's right. what you're expecting. If you're long, okay, you're long an asset and someone wants to buy it from you, the only way they're gonna get it is if they offer you more than you think it's worth. And so that incremental pressure 
But once the transaction occurs, the number of buyers and sellers are exactly the same. Yeah. And, and so with that being said, um, how do you feel about the volatility of, of this, this asset class, Bitcoin? Are we done with the days of 80 percent corrections in, in, uh, in bear markets or how do you feel about it? Depends. That? I mean, so the volatility is here to stay, right? Amazon, 28 years into being a public company, still has very high volatility every single year, right? Including this year, it's had a double digit drawdown. And that happens, mm -hmm. right? Every single year, on average, you lose 31% of your money in Amazon, but the stock just keeps going up over the long term. So, the volatility is going to be here. Now, the question of is it going to stay 80, 80, which is coincidentally the number that, that Amazon volatility is, or is it going to slowly trend down as more money comes in? That's just the law of large numbers, right? If exactly. I have a small dollar value, like I have $100 and I put in another couple hundred dollars, the volatility is going to get really high. If I have a million dollars and I add a few hundred dollars, there's no volatility at all. So as increasing uh, volumes come in, but the market cap gets bigger, the volatility will shrink. But it's never going to be a stable coin, I, I don't believe, because volatility is an indication of uncertainty or disagreement about the future. So if you yeah. think about a bond, right, we all know a bond is a contractual claim and if you, you know, lend to somebody who's credit worthy, they have to pay you back. So there's not a lot of volatility in bonds. Now, if interest rates rise a lot, there could be short term volatility. But at the end of the day, you hold a treasury bond to maturity, the government's going to pay you. They'll just print money to pay you. So the volatility of bonds is very low because the uncertainty is low. In equities, there's more volatility because we don't know. Right? When Amazon started, people thought that's a dumb idea. I don't want to buy stuff on the internet. I don't want to put my credit card on the internet. Today you do it without even thinking about it. Same thing with Bitcoin. In the early days, we're like, I don't want that. Today, like, huh, I get it. It's a perfect store of value. It's a better form of money. And over time, that uncertainty about the outcome will diminish. And so the question is, are the days of 80% drawdowns over? Well, the first cycle drawdown was 84. Second was 84. This last one was 77. I think this next one likely is a little bit less. Why? Well, because I think the upside of this cycle will be less too. If you go back to each of the previous halving cycles, we had these big run-ups. Went to 2.3, 2.4 times the fair value. Well, why would anything trade above fair value? Well, humans are going to human. Humans, mostly they can't do math to our, to our conversation earlier, but then secondly, <laughs> they FOMO, right? They, they, they see something moving and they got to get in. So the price goes up above fair value. Right. But then what happens is leverage comes in and the gamblers and the speculators come in and that pushes the price way above fair value. But at some point, gravity takes over and you head back toward fair value and you usually crash right through. And then you get to a washed out, really undervalued because you got margin calls and you got the unraveling. It's going to be interesting, though, because, you know, with boomers, they're not used to a 60 <laughs> percent. Like we're used to it. I'm used to it. You're used to it probably by now. Are like I'm just wondering what that looks like for them when they well, see their Bitcoin. The they're not going to be diamond hands either. They're not going to be hodlers. If right. this thing Look, what's going to happen, in my, my opinion, is the halving is going to occur. The fair mm -hmm. value is going to increase because that's yep. what happens when the halving occurs. The fair value goes up because the price needs to adjust to support the miners. Now, in this cycle, the fair value probably doesn't go up as much as previous cycles because we have this, this pre-halving event of the ETF which boosted the price closer to fair value so that most of the miners are, are doing okay right now. But, but the, the fair value is probably going to go up to call it, you know, 75 ish K would be my estimate. 
in a normal cycle, then the leverage comes in and it pushes that to 2.3, 2.4 times. Well, there's not as much leverage now because, you know, they got rid of CZ at Binance. So that's not as much leverage. And they got rid of some of the old bad actors in terms of the leveraged lenders. So let's say we only go up two times fair value this time. So we go to 150 ish. Okay. Well, then what happens? Well, then when you're so far above fair value, that's when the short sellers are come in and, and, and some of the people say, okay, that's good enough for me. I'll take a little profit. And then we start to go down. So how far down do we go this time? To your point, if, if somebody bought in today at, you know, 68, 69, whatever, and it's 150, they might not sell right away. Then, yeah, they won't. Yeah. You and I both know there are a whole bunch of people who are like, I'm going to wait for a pullback. And then it's going to go up some more. And then I'm going to wait for a pullback. And then it's going to go up some more. And when it gets to 110, they're going to be like, okay, I'm in. Well, then if it goes to 150, they're like, oh, this is awesome. Then it but as it back. starts to roll over in the next bear market, which I think happens, you know, at the end of 25, Yes, that's. Then I, what I would love to know why you think into twenty five because I have twenty five as well. Yeah, well, as, it, as again, a, as a the four year cycle. The four year cycle, oh, okay. I believe, is baked in because it's hard coded around the having, and the having creates this impetus for price to rise. People FOMO in, and we get above fair value. Inevitably, an asset either stays at f above fair value and grows into it. Now, now that's certainly possible. You know, you look at like Nvidia. Is Nvidia going to stay at a crazy ridiculous price and is the value going to grow into it or is it going to crash down so. back to I fair value like Cisco did, like Microsoft did, like Intel did. You know, here's the crazy thing. In 2000, Intel went up 20 fold over about 18 months, 20 times, just like NVIDIA, right? Everybody said their chip's going to change the world. It's going to be great. Today, 24 years later, it's down like 60% because what happened? NVIDIA happened. So is there another company? Well, AM, AMD. Come in and AMD really. NVIDIA? Yeah. Probably. It's possible. Yeah. yeah. Right. Not today, but, but probably. Yeah. So my only point there is I don't think the cyclicality is gone. I don't okay. think this is number go up in a straight line. I think we're going to have peaks and we're going to have troughs. And for a while, we're going to make higher highs and higher lows. That's called accumulation, right? Mm -hmm. So there's going to be an accumulation over the next year or so. Then when it gets too highly priced, there'll be distribution. The smart money, the people who bought early or some of the whales will start to distribute to the masses. And then when it falls, they buy back. But here's the, here's the, the part that, that I don't love. So we have this, this Bitcoin market that is the spot market. And yeah. these ETFs that are based on spot, really good. The problem is the futures market got bigger, meaning there are now more places like the CME and the CBOE and all this stuff where futures are available. Now, what does a future allow you to do? It allows you to create something out of thin air and sell it. So in the old days, oil, natural gas, any commodity, gold. In the olden, olden days, if I had oil and I wanted to sell it to you, I had to have the oil, right? I had to be able right. to go get the oil, put it in a barrel, send it to you, and settle up. And then the futures came along and said, no, 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 you can just write a contract that I'll sell you a paper barrel of oil. And then I could pretend that I'm going to go get a barrel of oil. But as long as we settle up the contract before I need to get the Roll barrel, over. No, yeah. no problem. Mm -hmm. So that allows people to naked short. And if you look at you know gold prices for years have been artificially suppressed because I the swear. big players can sell naked in Mark, the market that was literally my next question 
That was my con Comex. I'm wondering, is the Comex effect going to occur? I swear, it's literally the next question. Is the Comex effect going to occur in Bitcoin? Are we going to get to a point? I think we are. Yeah. Is it at 500000 Is it at a million? I don't know what the price is, but I feel like at some point, we're going to get stuck. And we're going to get stuck in sand 100%. with Bitcoin's price. Okay, you yeah. do agree as well. Okay. 100%. Look, because it's happening right now, right? You can see mm. it on certain days, right? Yeah. We gap down 10% right before the end of the day. Well, why? Mm. Well, ETFs can only trade for a very small window at the end of the day. They strike their nav actually at 359 every right. day. And here's the crazy thing. All of the gains in the Bitcoin ETF occurred after hours. There's been zero price increase during the day from 930 to four every day for the last three months, yeah, no sure. price increase. All of the price increase has occurred after hours. Well, why is that? Well, because again, if you have to buy a bunch of something, the oldest trick in the book, you don't actually start buying it. You actually sell it first. You actually might short it. You actually might spread rumors that it's a bad thing. I tell, you know, I tell a story all the time. There's a famous trade that Julian Robertson put on in copper. And the analyst came in with this big analysis on, on all the copper they were going to buy. And he said, okay, good. Uh, I like it. Let's do it. He says, well, how much should I buy? He says, no, you don't buy any. You go short 50 million and you tell everyone we hate copper. Mm. Push the price down, then back up the truck and buy it at a lower price. So you can see this happening day in, day out. And I think that's going to continue to happen. And to your point, as the total asset base gets bigger, the ability for the big institutions to put big shorts on to push the price down so they can keep accumulating at a lower price. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, and that's, and for the long term, that's okay because what that does is it creates a more liquid market, a deeper market. Now, they're kind of stealing, the institutions are kind of stealing from the moms and pops who are trying to speculate, but speculating is hard. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm much more of a buy and hold kind of person. It's like, if I like an asset, I wanna own it. And then I'm gonna own different assets in a portfolio on a diversified basis. And I'm gonna rebalance on occasion. Trading is hard. Speculating is hard. So I try to, and trading's really hard when you're going up against people with superior knowledge and resources and tools. Like right. anyone trying to day trade stocks today, you're fighting Ken Griffin. And if you haven't watched the movie, yeah. don't watch the movie. Citadel, it's right? amazing. Yeah. And the depictions of Ken and of Stevie, they're so good. I mean, they were a little uncharitable, but they were so good. And these guys, They're they have serious, more man. resources. They have more knowledge. They have more tools. There's no way you win. Except on a very rare occasion like GameStop. But even then, it was a short-term win because long-term, you know, right. those guys are going to win. What's the sentiment? Like, I'm hearing from people in the space, like, this is the last bull run for us uh, small guys. Um, nah, look, I mean... Is it the last big increase, like multiples? Kinda. And if you look, think about it, look, when it went from 0 0.003 cents mm -hmm. to a dollar, yeah, that was a miracle, right? That was the miracle of Bitcoin. Did it survive like the startup phase, the mm -hmm. science experiment? Getting to a dollar was the miracle. Right. Then running from a dollar to $10, that's amazing. 10 times your money. But then it fell 80%. And then it went from two bucks to 300. Oh my gosh, 150 times. And then it fell to like 186 or something. Then it went to a thousand. And then it went back down to 200. And then it went to 20,000. And then it went back to 3,000. So <laughs> yep. going from a thousand to 20,000, just math, right? 20,000, 20 times is a lot harder than 1,000 to 20,000. Right. And so from 68,000 to go up tenfold, I, I think it will happen, but it's going to take much longer. It won't be in this, yeah, right, right. 
It's going to take okay, so much I- longer. And and look, people ask all the time, well, what's the ultimate end game? Well, let's just think about this. Bitcoin today is digital gold. Now, Michael mm-hmm. Saylor wants you to say it's digital property. Ultimately, I, I believe that, right? Okay. Today, it's yeah. digital gold. What is gold? Gold is money. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. Mm-hmm. Total, and this is where people make a mistake. They say, well, total market cap of gold is $12 trillion. So the equity market cap, we're going up 10x from here. Mm-mm. Half of that gold doesn't count. It's jewelry mm-hmm. and chalices mm-hmm. and gold leaf on the Golden Dome, you know, back there at, at Notre Dame. So, no. So six trillion, that's five X from here, in the bank. Making five times your money from here, in the bank. You can you can call me on it. Okay? So that's like four hundred K. Easy. Easy. I mean like super easy. Fine. Okay, but then beyond that. Digital property. Now, digital property, real estate is about an $86 trillion global asset class. Is it possible that Bitcoin is a better form of property? Like, think about it. The American dream post World War II was what? Everybody buys a house, white picket mm-hmm. fence, we take a mortgage, and we, you know, make a ton of money. You bought a place in California when you came back from the war for 5,000 bucks. It's millions of dollars today. <laughs> Glorious. Okay. What is that? That's just currency devaluation. The house right. didn't go up. The house didn't right. grow. You didn't start with a two bedroom house and it turned into a 20 bedroom house. It's still a two bedroom house in the middle of a neighborhood that may if, have deteriorated over 50 years. If so, I could have kept that Snickers bar from 1940s, I would be <laughs> You're doing well exactly. too, right? <laughs> but it's not it's not that the thing got better, it's that the money got worse. Right. So right. if you put money into Bitcoin today and the money keeps getting worse, then it's gonna go up. And that's why I say all the time, one Bitcoin's one Bitcoin. Will always be one Bitcoin. It'll be that two bedroom house. But the average person today feels priced out of the housing market, but they can own Bitcoin. Because they can own I wonder what units. I want. I wonder what the future us are going to say. Uh, maybe generations from now. I think it's still too volatile. But you know how they say, "Go one ounce of gold to buy you a nice suit." I wonder what they're going to say about one bitcoin. What will one bitcoin after it settles? What will it buy you? I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. Is it's it a great, house? It's a great point. Is it a? No, it's a great yeah. point. So, so you know, today, right, sixty-eight thousand bucks is you know is what it's a it's a nice car it's not even a supercar it's a nice car i mean you can get a good ev you can get a good kia ev6 mm-hmm. for about 68 grand wow. um which is nice but i think that's probably it's a, it's a good point what is one bitcoin versus one ounce of gold for five thousand years one ounce fine a fine person suit so is one Bitcoin a nice car? And if you think Man. about it, 15 years ago, you know, when we made that first leap, um, it's an interesting point. At what point in the Metcalf's Law parabola right. Right. do we stop going up enough? I mean, I, I would hate to think that in 10 years, when it's trading at you know four or five hundred k, that that that's <laughs> a, what a decent car. Costs to get a car. I hope that's not the it case. Might, it might be. It, it might, might be. be yeah. It might be. It's funny because one of my members, I have a question, kind of going to that uh, in that in that direction. We'll get to it here in a second. I want to ask you uh, quickly about Bitcoin Investor Day. I saw you went out there. Uh, what was the sentiment there? A lot of smart individuals. Um, financiers and stuff. What are you talking about? It was a great day. What are they talking about? What's the sentiment? and Will did a great job um, putting this together. Packed house, lots of people, great speakers. I, I, you know, and I tweeted about this on Friday that um, I've been to a lot of events. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this 40 years. Uh, Been to a lot of events. And it was definitely in the top, you know, few events that I've been to. Interesting. 
and I've been to some great, some great events and, and the venue wasn't the reason it was the people, the people mm. that spoke were of two, two types. There were the OMGs like me, the old macro guys. So Novogratz <laughs> and Dan Chapiero and, and Scaramucci and, mm. and, uh, you know, all of us are, are old, right. And we've been around and we came from the macro world and, and it was interesting to hear them just be very humble about not getting it at first and, and then having the epiphany and, and realizing it's probably the best macro trade we'll ever see in our careers mm-hmm. and, and migrating and, and now spent, think about it. I mean, we all had perfectly good lives and put some of that at risk, right? There are people who told me I was an idiot. Just, well, that happens all the time, but, but I mean, clients that said you're an idiot. And why would you go do this stupid magic internet money? So that was, that was interesting. And, you know, the humility of, of being able to say, you know, you didn't, you didn't get it, but now you do is was, was good. The second type were absolute rocket scientists that, could have any job they want. They could be an investment banker, lawyer, you know, PhD teacher, literally working at SpaceX. Some of these, some of these young people. And here they are dedicating their life to, you know, working at some of the biggest brand names like Fidelity, BlackRock, you know, ARC to, to build out the, the future. And that's what gets me excited. Right. That's what I was That's what gets me to put on hoodies is I love hanging out with these young, talented, That's ambitious, so enthusiastic yeah. people because it's just fun. Mm-hmm. I'm having more fun than I've ever had. And I love my career. That's not that's not saying I didn't love working at universities. Right. And I didn't love being the asset man. This is just it's just fun. And to be around that many people. Uh, collectively at an event like this was, was fantastic. And, and I love the fact that it was in New York because, you know, a lot of times all these events are elsewhere, right? They're Puerto Rico or, you know, down in Miami and, and trying to, but my, you know, New York is still the, the center of the financial universe. Now maybe London. Well, I don't know how, for, how, how, for, for how much longer with uh, Lietta, uh, and and the uh, the stuff going on with Trump, man, that's a little weird, you know. Oh, uh, look, there's there's so but... much weirdness. Yeah. There's so much weirdness, and so so many bad policies and bad visions from D.C. from you know the the, the leaders, and I, I thought it was was really kind of funny when you know the Mooch said. Uh, you know, the choice going into this election year, which is kind of scary, was, you know, weekend at Joe Biden's versus one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And I was like, ooh, ooh. I mean, like that hit too close to home. And it's like, well, I don't like either one of those choices, but you got to choose, right? You got to vote for somebody. And what's scary to me, as great as this country is, and it's, you know, arguably the greatest country on earth. There are other people who would argue that, but, but whatever, that's the best we can do. Those are, Mm -hmm. those are the best two people we can get. Now you got RFK out there who, you know, runs circles around both of these guys in terms of, of intellect and, but it's just, our system just doesn't two party allow for that to work. I I mean, he's democratic, but he, yeah, just, I mean, if 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 I had to pick, yeah, on that side, I would do that the, the RFK route. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think that New York is uh, very scary. What they're doing to our um, our free capitalism, uh, capitalistic system, we're supposed to have. Look, least, but, and uh, you know, I, I, you know, between last time you and I spoke yeah. and today, I took a trip. Uh, actually, took two trips. Um, to check out other jurisdictions just in case, right? I don't want to move. I don't, I don't want, my wife's not moving, but, but if things get really, really ugly, like look, Europe just banned in theory, in theory, they just banned self custodial wallets. Yeah. Now, is it enforceable? 
Is it real? Will it stay? I don't know. But the fact that a a group of people actually thought this was a good idea, Mm -hmm. incomprehensible to me. And look, Ms. Warren would like to have that same bill passed here tomorrow. And that's why we all need to support John Deaton, right? John is running against her in in Massachusetts and we all need to contribute and we all need to, and and look, we can contribute three ways, time, talent, and treasure, right? If you don't have a lot of money to contribute, then get involved and, you know, use your time or your talent and, and, and help John, you know, uh, get into this seat. And ultimately, I don't, I don't think we're going to slide off the edge of the earth and into the abyss. I don't, but I do think this evolution of technology is so profound that it causes the incumbents to lose their minds. Mm -hmm. And it's not the first time this has happened, right? There have been these massive shifts in technological innovation around the printing press, Look, when the printing press came along, the church, remember the church was in charge at that point. The church told you how to live, told you what to think. Most people were illiterate and and they relied on on the pastor and the priest telling them what to do. And then suddenly you could give people materials to read and to write and to learn. and, And it busted the monopoly of the church wide open. And so for years media took control and and you're a great example right you are the new media right it used to be i would sit down and i would watch abc nbc or cbs and walter cronkite and the rest said the same or dan rather they said the same thing they were given talking points here's what you say and it wasn't state-owned media like china or russia but it was state-controlled media because they they gave us the talking points and then the internet busted that wide open. If you want information today, you don't wait to get it from the New York Times or the Washington Post or ABC or NBC or CBS. You come Mm -hmm. on the internet and you get it direct. And blockchain and Bitcoin in particular busts the monopoly that the banks and the governments, because they're intertwined through central banking, it busts that monopoly wide open. And I get that they don't like that. It's been 838 years of the golden age for banking. And and that's over. Do you think those draconian laws will come here, though, in regards to uh, the non-custodial yeah. wallet situation? Oh, yeah, I yeah. think so. It, it, yeah, I think for so. sure. For sure. I think They'll so. try. And whether or not there's enough power in the incumbency to get them passed, I don't know. I think there probably is. And I think it'll be like Executive Order 6102 in 1933. Did everybody take their gold and turn it in? Hell to the no. Did some people get arrested? Very few. Were there criminals from 1933 to 1975 in the United States that owned gold surreptitiously? For sure. So. You know, someone said, well, they can't enforce because I can memorize my seed phrase and you know, you're not going to attach electrodes to my head. Well, not yet. Uh, and take my seed phrase out. But yeah, I mean, could they could they make ledger a thing where if you plug your ledger into your computer, it alarms somewhere and they send the black hats to your house? They could. Do they have enough people to do that? No. Could they make your life miserable because, you know, you plug your ledger into your computer and suddenly your computer doesn't work? They could do that. Could they make it so your electricity at your house goes off? They could do that. So is it going to get ugly? I don't know. I hope not, because what happens in that anarchy? There'll be rebellion, you know, pitchforks and and bonfires and, you know, French Revolution wasn't pretty. It happened. Right. And Napoleon got kicked out and Louis and, and took a long time for them to recover and they lost being superpowers because of it. But um, that's how empires end. Empires end in anarchy because mm-hmm. 
the power that you use to grab the, 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 the mantle leads to the politics of cronyism and you put your friends in power and everybody's dot, you know, like, think about this. We saw, and, and this is not political. It's just Mitch McConnell was the guy who actually said it. And um, he said, that money that we vote for, it's not going to Ukraine. I mean, it's going to Ukraine, but then it's coming back to us and it's going to companies in my jurisdiction that, that I own a little piece of. And he just said it out loud. And I was like, wow, wow. And that's corruption. And so when the corruption becomes so great that the people say, "Mm -mm, no more, but we're not there. I think we're, but I think we're very close. We're close. No, we're close. And and, and I'll tell you, if you, if you start, I mean, here's the thing, CBDC, right? the antithesis of freedom. Yeah. Imagine a world where like your fiat today, it it's controlled in the sense that, you know, I tried to buy a little Solana yesterday, Sunday bank was closed and couldn't do it. Right. Because my bank wasn't open to send the Solana from my debit card and they don't have technology to make that work. They got to wait for the bank to be open to send, to oh, approve wow. the transaction. And it wasn't even a big transaction. Imagine if I had to do a lot of money and there are ways to get more up, but the banks can still, cause the bank's money. Remember when you put your money in the bank, it's theirs, not ours. Yes. So here's, here's the real problem. A CBDC, it's Friday afternoon, you get paid. You have a couple cocktails, you drunk text about the president, you wake up on Saturday and your money doesn't work. Yeah. That could never happen. Well, sure shit could. Absolutely mm-hmm. could. Well, then what happens if Target pays some senator a little something, something, and suddenly your money doesn't work at Walmart? They want you to shop at Target. That could ne- Well, that, that could happen too. Because yeah. once the money's programmable, mm-hmm. whoo. All bets are off because if a small number of people control the programming, all kinds of bad stuff. The thing that's great about Bitcoin, no one can change it. I loved when Jamie Dimon said, you know, Satoshi's just going to show up and print 21 million more. (laughs) And Jameson Lopp said, hey, Jamie, here's the code that says that can't happen. Now, if 51% of people say we want to change it, that's different. But one person can't do that. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, man. Uh, very concerned, very concerned for Mike. You know, I have young kids, so I'm, I'm just concerned. I, I, you know, just to really quick before I make that point, Solana, I ragged on Solana for a whole year and a half. I called it the Windows 95 of blockchain, the blue screen of death, always going down all that. But I actually that's another conversation. Maybe I'll have you on a little sooner than uh, the gap we've seen since our last time, because I want to talk about Solana. I think that has a pretty big future. But um, the, it could. You know, my, it could. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. has to fix some stuff, but it, it certainly. Yeah, could. it does for sure. It's not perfect. One of my users' questions, my YouTube Premium members had a question regarding MicroStrategy, and you know, before we I ask that question, I do have to ask you, how do you feel about MicroStrategy now, seeing that we now have the ETFs? It was really propped up to me as a proxy to own Bitcoin yeah. from a lot of people, but uh, my theory is that that proxy is going to close as more people on board with spot ETF pro, uh, products. I mean, what do you, yes what do you and no, take right? on that? I mean, it certainly was one of a number of, of Bitcoin proxies. You could own that. You could own the miners, although the miners wasn't direct because the miners produce and they hold for a while, but ultimately they have to sell to pay for electricity and machines. But, but MicroStrategy is different, right? He's using the capital markets to borrow money in in lousy money, fiat, and buy hard money, Bitcoin. And so it's actually a little better than a proxy because it's a leveraged proxy. Now, the leverage can't be infinite. So there is a limit to how much leverage you can get. But every time he borrows money to buy Bitcoin, that's a levered trade that the average person. Now, the average person could do it, too, right? You could take out a margin loan 
against your stocks. And you could use that money to buy Bitcoin. So it's not a direct leveraging. But now you could actually have the Bitcoin ETF. And if they'll make you a margin loan against it, which I don't know if they will or won't, then you could kind of do a sailor. So will some people do that? Sure. But the average person doesn't have the guts, probably in a good way, to do what Michael's done. I mean, he committed to something and he's been diamond handed about it through some really serious volatility. So kudos to him. But the problem now is that it trades at a premium, not just to the value of the Bitcoin, but to the levered value of the Bitcoin. So could that premium close and cause um, volatility that, that, that makes some people crazy? Sure. So I do think there will always be some demand by sophisticated investors that look at that and say, it's just a better way to get Bitcoin because I don't have to manage the keys. I don't have to worry about cold storage. I can let this guy have institutional quality storage and he's levering up for me on my behalf because he's borrowing at basically zero. So, but, you know, it, it is over right out, now, though, so. right? It, it, it's, that play is going to run out if, if interest rates stay elevated and, and if we have to stop pausing and, and start. And it's supply right? and demand, though, right? I mean, here's the problem. There's so much demand, again, from us boomers, yes, there is. that we have to have in, in our minds, we have to have some fixed income in our retirement portfolios, you'll you'll 60, 40 model. And let's say we take 5% out of bonds and put it in, in Bitcoin, that's still 35% in bonds. So there's just so much demand for traditional fixed income that, yeah, interest rates are five and a half, but he's still borrowing at one. I mean, it's, that's just supply and demand. There's too much demand for his bonds because people look at that and say, yeah, it's unsecured debt, but I have this company that basically owns one asset. So if it was unsecured debt against his software business, he ain't getting 1%. He'd have to pay 10, 15, some yeah, big he's number. Not he's, he ain't because making money. He that didn't software make it business. Last is, quarter he didn't. Yeah. Software business yeah. is not, you know, that's not the thing. And I said, I, I admire that he took the plunge. I'm surprised actually that other companies haven't followed suit, at least a few, but mm -hmm. um, there's probably quietly some that are doing it maybe without the fanfare, but uh, very so few. So where do you see, Mike? so the question my member had is where do you see MicroStrategy in a decade? Uh, what's their end game? I don't, yeah, if you want to kind of. Look, I mean, on that. I said today, I think it's a little overbought. Um, so I probably wouldn't be buying a lot of it here. I would accumulate on dips. As long as he stays true to the strategy, which I think he's going to, um, you know, you can calculate, you know, how many Bitcoin he owns, you know, how much leverage he has. So you can calculate the, the ratio of what the, the fair value is. And he said, but, but then the, the, the asset's going to appreciate, it's going to be worth more. Right. But that gets instantaneously reflected in the price, which is why the price keeps going up. Right. So you can do the math on on the shares and you know someone said well it's, it should be valued at infinity because you know it's going to keep going up fine but so buying it today and holding it yeah i think that that, that makes sense but trying to trade it here i wouldn't do that yeah uh last question for you from a member it says here how high does he see uh, bitcoin going and what will a gallon of milk cost when Bitcoin hits its high? Um, we got to know the yeah. cost of living, not just the price of Bitcoin. So it's that whole price and value thing, right? Yeah, look, there, there are two reasons for Bitcoin price to change. One is supply and demand, right? If there's excess demand for limited supply, price will rise. The other is the devaluation of the currency. Now, in 2020, right, the government doubled the money supply. So the price of Bitcoin should have doubled. And it did. It went from like 15,000 to 30,000. Well, but then why is it 68,000? Well, 
because the demand for Bitcoin continues to rise mm -hmm. and there's a limited supply. So now, because the money supply actually contracted in the last 12 months, well, then why is the gallon of milk going up? Well, the gallon of milk hasn't gone up so much in the past year. Two years ago, it went up a lot. But in the last year, I think gallon of milk, I think, probably pretty, pretty stable. Now, if they get back to printing money, meaning if the Fed cuts rates and they increase the money supply, which does not appear to be imminent, then a gallon of milk will continue to go up. Now, there are other things in the cost of living that, that suck right? You know, restaurant prices. Why are restaurant prices up? Well, because they can't get help. Okay. And because minimum wages laws keep getting passed. And so that I just saw this drive through I go to called cookout down here in North Carolina, $14 an hour, $14 an hour. That that's a lot to make hamburgers. And again, I'm not, I'm not demeaning gonna, that job. I'm just saying that just that's a lot it. more than it was two years ago. And so yeah. the price of those hamburgers is not rising, not because the beef's going up or because the cheese is going up, but because the labor cost is going higher. And so yeah. that's ultimately the difference between devaluation of currency. Some people call it inflation. I just call it devaluation of the currency. Like that Snickers bar when I was growing up was 25 cents. Snickers sure, bar today is like two bucks. Right. Yeah. I want, yeah, I want one of those. Right. And they were big <laughs> right now. Yes, they were. You, you got shrink inflation. In, but, yeah. <laughs> but what the worst is the fake inflation, mm. like I guess Coke in the fat cans, little stubby fat cans. Now everybody wants these tall, skinny cans, like the Heineken tall, boy, tall can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they change. It's still the same amount. So it's still 12 ounces. Okay. But the price went water. Up. Oh, okay. Well, no, the price went up because it's cool. Like, no, no, wow. it's the same product, same amount of aluminum, right? The long can, it's still a 12 ounce can. It's not like it's a 24 ounce hey, can. Hey, Mark, but hey, guess what? Uh, Biden told us uh, it's the corporation's problem. You're the reason why this is happening. <laughs> what? You know, look, <laughs> what? It, it's, it's really interesting to watch a government try to put the blame on the corporations when at the end of the day, the only way They're to create the reason. devaluation of currency it's is to print point. more currency. And the people yeah. who are in charge of the printing currency are the government. And yeah. look, we're running a 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollar deficit. Yes. So why is that? Corruption. I mean, that's just pure corruption. Pure corruption. Absolute pure corruption. Mm -hmm. And that is why we're devaluing our dollar. And I said, this is, this is not unique to us. You can go back to Roman times. And Rome yeah. had these, these current, this currency called the denarius. And the denarius was made of 100% silver. Yeah. And so as the empire became bigger and stronger, the people who helped, right? The, the governors were brought to central Rome and they were given, you know, things to govern. Well, if you're a governor, well, you need to have, and, and somebody has a circus, right? Someone has a Colosseum. Well, you need to have a Colosseum. Well, how are you going to get a Colosseum? You need it to be built. Well, how are you going to build it? You don't have enough money. So what they started doing, started melting down the coins. Yeah. And putting in bronze or copper and making mm -hmm. coins with only 50% silver, but they had more coins and they would pay the workers to build this, this new circus. Well, after a while, the, the workers said, well, what the fuck? This is mm -hmm. not silver. This is like, it's like copper. Exactly. So they started demanding more wages. Yep. Right. And the problem is, Rome was safe, but the surrounding empire had to be defended by foot soldiers. Mm. And as the foot soldiers demanded more wages, what happened? If the government couldn't give them higher wages, 
they quit. They over, yeah. well, when they quit, what happened? They got sacked. The Visigoths yeah. and everybody came in, and that was the end of the Roman Empire in 473 BCE. So, I mean, AD. Um, so that is happening right now in real time. It is. Right? We having to pay fry cooks $14 an hour, and people still don't want to work because it's not enough to pay the bills to buy the milk. And so you have this downward spiral. And then you, we, and haven't even, we haven't even instituted uh, UBI, which we know that's going to come as well. That's on the way. So that just compounds yeah, it is. and accelerates the issue. But see, here's the thing. You can opt out. You can pick up and you can go to El Salvador or Costa Rica or Portugal or any of these other places. Oh, but those are expensive too. Not the same. Right. You can now would you what opt kind of life you the, want to live, right? If you want yeah. to live a life on, you know, Fifth Avenue in New York and go to Broadway shows every night and eat at the finest restaurants. Great. You can't replicate that. But if you just want to live, right, you want to be with your family, consume food, barter. There's you can you can get by on a much lower standard of living in lots of other places around the world. And I think those places will become increasingly more attractive. Now, the, the real shit show would be, and this is exactly what happened in Rome, is it starts to fracture from a single empire to multiple states. So you mm -hmm. see you know, Texas saying Texas. they're going to secede or California mm -hmm. saying they're going to secede. That's the kind of stuff where you're, you know you're at the end game of yeah, buddy. power. Yikes, man, that is that is insane. The only thing about America is there's other, one other country in the world that does this, Etruria, I think. They tax their citizens abroad. So right, you, right. Yeah, so I don't know. It's well, but here's taxation the problem. There. If you taxed all of our wealth, forget our income, if you taxed all of our wealth, every American, every dollar they have, you couldn't pay down the debt. Nope. So we're, we're past the point of no return. So the only way out is for continued currency devaluation. So the question about where's that gallon of milk going to be when Bitcoin hits 500K? Six bucks, eight bucks, 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's not pretty. Yeah. yeah. It's not pretty. Well, there you have it, guys. Mark Yusko, founder, CEO, and CIO of Morgan Creek Capital. I appreciate you coming on, bro. This was, uh, as always, a pleasure. And I'll have to have you come back on because I want to talk Solana. But more importantly, I actually want to talk some like non-crypto stuff. I want to talk AI. I don't know if you're invested in AI. We are. I personally think I have the same gut feeling about AI the way I had the feeling about Bitcoin 11 years ago. So I want to talk to you about that. A hundred percent. But in the meantime, between us talking about it, mm -hmm. you can go to our, you know, uh, at Digital Creek. So Morgan Creek Digital has a, a YouTube channel called Digital Currents yep, uh, or at Digital Currents. I'll and uh, we below. cover every week the A, B, C, Ds of the digital age, AI, blockchain, chips, and data. So you're, nice. you're right on. And okay. uh, we'll talk more about that next time. All right. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. If you want to see more videos and interviews like this from influential people in tech, finance, and sports, subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the bell to be alerted. And go a step further and join the YouTube and membership area for early releases of videos like this. I'm out of here. Ha!